Welcome everyone to today's webinar, which will focus on risk management as it relates to, to leverage ETFs, hedged equity, private equity, and portfolio construction. I'm your moderator, Dara Albright, co-founder of DWealth Education. First, I'd like to begin by thanking Clout, a growth marketing AI-powered fintech platform for assembling today's panel of esteemed investment managers who will be sharing how they approach the most common forms of risk, including market risk, concentration risk, and credit risk, and how these risk factors factor into their near and long-term investment strategies. Our speakers include Mark Sunderhaus, Primark Capital, Mark Odo, Swan Global Investments, Robert Gilliland from Concentra Wealth, Ariel Acuna from LTG Capital. Uh, before we jump in, I just have a couple of housekeeping items for everyone attending today. First, this webinar will last one hour. Uh, there will be 15 minutes of time for the panel discussion and 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, feel free, though, if you have questions that you want to ask the panelists, you could, you could put them in the chat box to your right. Uh, but just please make sure that if it's a question, you want to make sure that uh, you put a question mark next to it, and we but and know that we won't get to answering that until the uh, last uh, ten minutes of the session. Um, you're also welcome to use the public chat box to also discuss the you know the panel as we go along, and provide any kinds of feedback. We always welcome that. Uh, but just all feedback, please make sure it's re relevant to the discussion and no advertisements or anything like that. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, the Investments and Wealth Institute has accepted this webinar for one hour of CE credit towards the CIMA, CPWA, CIMC, and RMA certifications. This webinar is also being recorded, and we will also um, be able to provide the recording of this webinar on demand to other listeners um, as well for CE credit for those same certifications. So let's begin and jump in. Uh, first, let's let's begin by asking our panelists to go one by one, uh, just each introducing yourselves, uh, your firms, and your typical clientele, so we get to know who you are. And maybe Mark, will, Mark uh, Sunderhouse, we'll start with you. Hi. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, our firm is Primark Capital. And we are the first to have a 33 Act fund that allows allocation for advisors across private equity, diversified by vintage year industry and geography that uh, doesn't require any sub docs and isn't a requirement to have accredited or qualified investors. And we invest in top uh, well-known uh, private equity funds focusing on the mid-market uh, where there has been a lot of uh, decline in the issuance of small cap stocks and um, our sole goal and sole focus is on advisors only uh, between roughly 300 million and a few billion dollars. That's the uh, main market that we're addressing. So thank you for uh, joining today. When Ariel, how about you? Sure, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ariel Acuna. I'm owner of LPG Capital, a fee only RIA. For most of my career, I've been a financial advisor to individuals. However, I have a financial strategy with a 10 year plus track record that I recently listed on Fidelity Separate Account Network. And I'm transitioning my focus away from financial advisory uh, to solely working with RIAs and other institutional investors so they can successfully use my strategy with their clients going forward. Marco? Yes, uh, so it's Mark Odo. I am with the Swan Global Investments. Uh, Swan is a hedged equity shop. Uh, we've been at it for 25 years. And we offer a variety of hedged equity solutions across mutual funds, ETFs, separately managed accounts. Uh, the whole idea is offsetting uh, that market systematic risk to some degree and help preserving capital. And Robert. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Gilliland. I, I spent the first 25 years of my career at a major wirehouse. Uh, in the last 17 in leadership in some form or fashion with the last three of those uh, uh, meeting with senior leadership. There are 12 of us across the country that met with senior leadership on a quarterly basis. 
it was during that time that I realized that there was something better that we could do to help clients. And so uh, February of 2020, we started Consensual Wealth Management. That's right. Just three weeks before the whole world shut down. Um, but we had an amazing um, a transition. Our clients moved over and we've been running ever since. Uh, but most recently, um, uh, another partner firm with Sanctuary Wealth and myself started another firm called uh, Six Degrees Wealth Management, which which is designed to really provide for our two RIAs, individual financial advisors at wirehouses, one of two things, either a great exit strategy or delivery to a platform to help them grow their business and just make business easier and do better for them. And great. So that's what we do. Great. All right. Well, we're going to jump in. Um, thanks for the introductions. And I think we should start by really talking about some of the major risks that your clients are currently seeing or feeling right now. Um, you know, and maybe you kind of get, get to the bottom of what keeps them up at night. And maybe Mark Odo, you could start with, um, with that and kind of addressing sort of what is it that keeps your clients up at night right now? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to this discussion because I believe that risk is a many headed, many headed hydra. There's many different ways that people perceive risk or deal with risk. But for our clients and our client base, it's always our philosophy has been always been built around this idea that the biggest risk that a lot of investors face is the risk of a major market sell off. You know, the risk that the markets might sell off by 30, 40, 50 percent. Uh, and it's been a while since we've seen that, uh, but we have had the two biggest bear markets since World War II have happened since the start of the new millennium. And we had the big sell-off, obviously, with the dot-com bust. We had a few short years afterwards, the, the sell-off associated with the global financial crisis. And in each of those cases, the equity markets lost about half of their value. Now, the most recent COVID crisis was a little bit odd in the sense that, yes, the markets did lose about a third of their value over five weeks, but they recovered so quickly, it's offsetting all-time highs again. But that being said, um, one of the biggest risks that I always like to ask people when I've get in, gotten in front of them is ask them, okay, well, raise your hand. What, what, which one concerns you more? Is it the state of the equity markets or the state of the fixed income markets? And over the last seven years, it's been interesting because sometimes people, people throw up both their hands, like almost in capitulation. But if you have that slide available, uh, I'd like to share it. Uh, that kind of outlines some of the risks of both sides of the market. Um, when you think about, you know, the fixed income side, uh, you know, one of the things that, that people are facing uh, is that the bond market is out of gas. For the last 40 years, bonds have been a fantastic investment, but the traditional role of bonds providing both capital preservation and income uh, it seems uh, unlikely to uh, continue going forward. You can have either capital preservation or yield, but probably not both. And certainly with inflation on the rise, this is going to make a fixed income even more challenged. Now, on the equity side of the markets, you know, we had a great run. The markets are up about 100 percent over the last three years cumulatively. But we're at this point where valuations are really stretched. And I think people are realistically expecting some more challenges uh, go going forward. Now, this is difficult because these are the two major building blocks, blocks of most people's portfolios, right? I mean, you talk about your basic uh, portfolio construction has been able, uh, you've been able to achieve your goals with 60% uh, in stocks, 40% in bonds, and you've gotten good results. Uh, going forward, it's kind of pick your poison. You're stuck between a, a rock and a hard place if you're only mixing these two. So that's, you know, we've got some things. Where I'll talk about a little bit later how Swan addresses these risks, but this is what our uh, client base is facing with is this concept of a dual dilemma where, where the major two components of, of portfolios are stressed or challenged going forward. Now, how about also the fact of outliving their money? Are you guys, you know, and maybe Robert, I see you shaking your head. Do, do you want to start? What, what are your thoughts there? Are you hearing that a lot from your clients? Yeah, no, I know. I, I think that Mark really hit it kind of on the head. When we talk to our clients and we spend the vast majority of our time talking with clients about retirement planning, income planning, um, my office happens to be right in the middle of the energy corridor uh, right here in Houston. And we have a lot of people who are retiring uh, looking to start that next stage. And the thing that the when we talk to them about risk, really what we have to do is dig down. And that is what 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 are they fearful of and what is risk? Because those can be two different things. Right. What people are telling us uh, almost across the board, the two biggest things that they're fearful of is one is health care as they get older. But number two is the fear of outliving their money. 
Um, and, and so you have to kind of go through and manage. So if, they, if they're, if they assume that it's risk, which is volatility standard, you know, money moving up and down or the value of the portfolio moving up and down, that's one thing. If it's fear of, of their port of, if it's fear of outliving their money, that that's another, right? So, so the way we do it is we call it the age approach, any sort of income plan. And what we do with the age approach is look at any sort of plan has to be adaptable because what you do today is going to be different than tomorrow. It has to have an opportunity for growth and you have to ensure that that capital is available. So in order to combat that, in order to work through, clearly you have to have a plan, right? I mean, that goes without saying. You have to look at what probabilities of success and all that, which is something that everyone everyone goes through and they do. But what we do is we break this down into five-year buckets, right? So the first bucket is for years one through five, next buckets for years six through 10, and then the 10 plus bucket. Once a client understands this, then they have the ability to be patient because you assign very conservative growth rates to all three of those, and it gives a client peace of mind. That prevents them from making bad decisions. Now, that's not to say that the portfolio that you set up today is the portfolio that is what it's gonna be here in six weeks, six months, or anything like that, but you absolutely have to plan um, for, for what their income needs are gonna be and then go through to stress test that. I really think that that what we're doing to help keep clients from making it so they're able to sleep well is make sure that they understand that and then review and track our progress as we as we go through. That's great. Mark asked you want to add on to that. I really don't have anything to add, except I completely agree with all the comments. And the only thing that we're seeing is um, advisors treating client money much more like a pension plan or much more like a high net worth family office and thinking past back to the five year bucket or 10 years and hedging, thinking about maybe a more patient approach with private equity. And there's more tools to diligence it now through pitch book or looking as an example at our underlying holdings. So um, we think finally the distinction between private markets and alternatives has arrived where there's a lot of alternative strategies, but people are having a better chance to understand uh, private markets from infrastructure to real estate to private equity to credit. Um, the only concern I do have would be um, echoing the, the comments from Mark um, Odo is so much more credit is out there now and so much of it is in private hands that, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping we have a natural correction in the markets, not another credit crisis, because the amount of credit, I think, as everyone knows, is substantially more than what the equity markets represent. So that that's kind of my my main concern when I think about the private equity firms we invest in. Well, well, thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to diving into a lot more on the private equity side and alternatives as we get further into the webinar today. Uh, Ariel, how about you? What, what do you, what keeps your clients up at night? Uh, right. I mean, especially for the people who are getting closer to retirement or not, uh, you know, not living for a paycheck. Uh, you've got to make it abundantly clear uh, for them that there is a mutually exclusive uh, situation happening regarding finances uh, in retirement, and that that is either uh, uh, they outlive their money or their money outlives them, and that there isn't any intersection between the two. And so you want, obviously, uh, the, the money to outlive them, and we structure things so that uh, that happens, right? Uh, it's, you know, you think that you go through most of your life working for a paycheck, and then when that's not there anymore, you have to make the transition, and it's uh, it's difficult for them to comprehend. So the things that we do to uh, alleviate their concerns is number one is we make sure that there is sufficient uh, savings and emer especially emergency cash reserves. Uh, not being prepared for large or unexpected expenses can derail any financial plan. Uh, the number two is that um, we, um, I require every one of my clients, believe it or not, to be 100% equity invested. They've got to be good with it or they don't work with me, right? I can, they can have as much savings, as much cash as they want, but uh, it's 100% equity invested with me. And, you know, they're going to need the growth of equities to survive and hopefully thrive for the 30 or 40 or more years uh, on this planet. Uh, third, uh, I employ an income drawdown strategy based on what endowments use. Right, endowments generally want funds to last forever, so they're a good mo model to follow. So what endowments do is average out asset, asset balances over a three-year period and then cap the percentage to draw down to a number. We use 5%. And this is good for uh, clients because it smooths 
uh, it smooths out absolute dollar drawdowns and it's more predictable income for them. All right. And when we have a bear market, we go to their emergency cash reserves for income. And lastly, I work hard at keeping uh, our, our clients invested in equities by passionately delivering what I call lifeboat drills. These are historical examples, charts, or hypothetical situations. I put them in and take them through to get them to feel the emotions they're going to feel in ma major uh, market setbacks. Uh, in this manner, uh, I periodically and overtly brainwash my clients for their own good, mm -hmm. all right, and they know this, <laughs> uh, so that they have proper investment habits. And this is what I do to alleviate uh, the outliving for money concerns. So, you know, when we talk about some of the uh, broader economic risks that we're seeing today, and I know inflation has really been on a lot of people's minds. We're seeing that on the news every day now. I mean, it's, it's, we see that every time we go to the, the you know, gas pumps or the grocery store. What are, um, you know, how are you guys looking at it? I mean, how much are you hearing from your clients of, of you know, that they're hearing now, you know, that they're fearing inflation? Um, and, you know, what are you doing to help maybe even alleviate those concerns and help them outpace inflation? Um, and maybe, Robert, you want to start, kick that off? Yeah, I mean, I think given what the Fed's saying and then given what all the other pundits are saying, um, the big key, I think that as advisors, what we have to do is we have to be flexible, right? Um, uh, we, we, we have to, we have to, because the last 10 years, years have, have, have been really, really easy. Um, one, I think that as an advisor, what we have to do is communicate to clients kind of what the plan is, make sure that, that we let them know what, that we have a game plan that's in place. If this happens, then we need to do that. If that happens, then we need to do that. And so that, that's, from a client standpoint, I think we've got to communicate with them in the manner and at the cadence that they need or want. So that's number one. Um, next thing that I think that that as an advisor or a wealth manager that that we have to do is is we have to we have to be prepared to dial up or dial down the risk that we're taking on because the last call it 10 or 15 years have been relatively easy to manage money. You could turn the temperature up much like a thermostat, right? When it's too cold, you turn the heat up and when it's too cold, you dial it back down. And, and I think we've been through a period where a lot of people have been lulled into it's easy. Um, so what you have to do is you have to go through and, and I'll give, share with you kind of some interesting points. Number one is if you go to look at where kind of inflows of retail funds are, there's been a tremendous amount of outflows. In fact, large growth is experiencing outflows right now, net outflows, while at the very same time, large blend is experiencing large inflows. So working and talking with clients, kind of like what Ariel said about the equity side, is making sure that you're in the right types of companies that can benefit. Same is true when clients are looking at their 401ks. 49% of money inside of fixed income is in is in intermediate term bonds. The reality is, is that given what the Fed's saying, there's risk and volatility with that. And they might be able to get the same type of yield, virtually the same yield when you compare the two versus the 10, as what you end in, in a much, much shorter duration fund or shorter term income. And so helping clients through that and starting to position that is is where clients are finding value and so like using bonds as an example maybe being in a two-year maybe two years is a better place to be as opposed to to intermediate and mark mark uh odo what what how are you uh tackling it and some of you know the uh inflation fears and how are you seeing it yeah, well, I think inflation is just uh, another thing to worry about when you think about some of these other challenges that we kind of outlined previously. But I think that's opened up uh, channels for solutions like what Swan offers, as well as other people that say, like, look, we're going to need to expand our toolbox, right? I mean, the standard kind of toolkit was insufficient. And whether that means we need to look at, you know, uh, income from like private type sources, whether it means hedged equity, which like Swan does, uh, some of these other types of concepts, the tactical asset allocation, those are all potential ways that you can solve this but yeah i mean i think you're right i mean historically speaking it's been easy uh because because one you know inflation's been low your your money could maintain its purchasing power and two essentially the fed put was in place where anytime the market um you know sold off the fed come rushing in to, to, to bail everyone out and that happened in 1998 with long-term credit it happened after the dot-com bust it happened uh uh obviously in the pandemic every time the, the fed just threw money at the problem 
which I think is just a matter of, you know, kicking the can down the road. Um, I know that uh, one of my colleagues here on the call lives in um, uh, Colorado and we have all these forest fires. For us, there's that kind of this philosophy that, you know, look, some burnoff is necessary. You get these forest fires, which are necessary to kind of get rid of the overgrowth and the, the, the what, what's the word, the, um, you know, the, all the junk there. You need a little bit of fires to purge things. But when the U.S. Forest Service comes in and stops any kind of fire from ever happening, you get these excesses that build up. And that causes the potential for these big infernos, which, which are really hard to stop. So, you know, it's an analogy. I, I think that um, sooner or later you're going to have to deal with these things. And I do think that, um, you know, the, the Fed is certainly indicating that uh, they are taking inflation seriously. And, and some of the um, maneuvers that they might take are going to be harder than some people are willing to digest in the short term. I think you make an interesting point, too, when you say, um, you know, kicking the can down the road, and that's what they've been doing, and, you know, jumping in to, you know, ease or, or what have you to, you know, alleviate some, some of that, the market's um, uh, sell-off. But have we come, and I'd love to get your guys' opinion on this, have we come to the end of the road now? Is that really where the, the, the inflation fears are stemming from today? Do we feel like there's this is the end of the road or is there wiggle room? We'd love to hear what anyone thinks on that. And I'm in, I'm in the contrarian camp here just a little bit until we kind of get through the supply chain disruptions. We always make knee jerk reactions. Um, it doesn't mean I don't think we couldn't have inflation really rear its head, but at the same time, in watching what private equity is doing, you know, like a lot of public companies, there is a similarity here, but it's a much longer view. So they're looking to avoid OEMs, as an example, where you get squeezed, VARs, value-added resellers. Um, they're not chasing real estate as much. Some of these asset prices have maybe run their course, and I think we need to really pay attention to what happens with wage inflation. Uh, we haven't seen that spike yet. Is it, If wage inflation follows, I'm particularly worried in the meantime, we don't spend very much time looking at the public markets um, because what we buy has such a long term horizon. But I grew up, you know, in the Jimmy Carter era uh, when that was pretty ugly. I don't I hopefully we don't go back to 17 percent. You know, yields on CDs were 13, 14. So I think you've scared people adequately. The question is, uh, is the supply chain and everything in commodity to trucking protests to semiconductor chip shortages? Is it a function of the environment we're coming out of because we pulled so much through so fast forward? I, I don't know, but I think some, in some ways patience here until we get to the latter half of the year is warranted to be somewhat nimble by advisors because you could, you could go all in the wrong way and regret it. Yes, great points. And um, Ariel, I mean, maybe you could also uh, talk a little bit about um, the aqueduct strategy. I'd be curious to hear about that and how that tackles some of the uncertainty surrounding fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, sure. Uh, the, um, in a nutshell, uh, the aqueduct strategy uh, takes full, of, full advantage of two things, people's propensity to regularly panic in mass and the market's eventual recovery, right? Uh, by way of background, in normal, normal times, like pre-pandemic, we were fully invested in equity ETFs, small, medium, and large, domestic and international. And uh, in times of severe bear markets, when the market is down 30, 40, or 50% or more, and there's massive fiscal and monetary stimulus being deployed or on the horizon, we exit our ETFs and buy two times levered domestic ETFs, small, medium, and large. And that's what we did in March of 2020. And then we just hold on until the Fed begins raising rates. And so as monetary uh, shifts, uh, as monetary stimulus shifts to neutral, we exit the levered ETFs and go back to our non-levered portfolio. So right now, there is uncertainty as we're right at the beginning of the Fed pivot to neutral, you know. Uh, but um, uh, how long it'll take to get to a neutral stance is anybody's guess, because I think they're going to try to take it easy. Um, the, um, uh, you know, prior to this, this, this inflation that we just had, the biggest problem over the last two decades was the risk of deflation, right? So I don't think we go from two decades of deflation to uh, a persistent inflation. Yes, you know, and rentals and, um, you know, the, the salaries are an issue, but the rest, I think, is probably uh, temporary. 
So right now, since Fed funds rates are still at zero, we're still risk, risk on and invested in the levered ETFs. At some point, when Fed funds are at three, three and a half percent, we'll begin a uh, transition to uh, the non-levered exchange traded funds as part of our strategy. And I see a question came in relating to inflation too, and I thought that since we're on the topic, it would be a good time to do, uh, address it because um, one of the listeners is asking, is anyone putting together a plan for 10% inflation or higher? And curious to hear some of your responses to that. No. No, okay, so you're shaking your head, okay. <laughs> In, in, in all of our planning, what we've done is we've gone through and kind of stress tested uh, the plans with, in, with higher inflation. Um, uh, I'm not certain that I would be convinced that we're headed to a 10% inflation right here uh, or, or higher, uh, uh, but clearly we're going to have higher costs, right? If you had that uh, employee that was earning $10 an hour and now to keep them on board, we're now paying them 20 we're not necessarily going to go in, cut their, their, their pay is not going to necessarily, their salary income is not going to be cut back down just because of where things are. So I think wages, we're still going to see some of those pressures that are going to be there, but I'm not certain that we're going to see prices higher because of like what everyone's talked about, the deflationary pressures are still there. Technology is making it so that prices are coming down. And let's be honest that if that $10 job can be replaced by a robot or a computer, it's going to happen. Um, it happens at McDonald's right now. I mean, a, a drive through used to have three people work in the drive through Now it's one, and that one person pushes a button, and the drink fills, right? And so so there's a job that's lost. So we're, we're, we're seeing that. But I do think that when you're talking about planning for retirement, you have to you have to take that into account, right? You have to take higher than what we're used to inflation because we haven't had it for a long time such an interesting point to think about the the technological impact because you know mark s you brought up um the jimmy carter days before and look how far we've come with technology since so you know that is definitely something i think that would need to be factored in really interesting point so I also want to jump into a little bit um, on the alternative asset investing, especially during these times. And as we're also seeing more and more, more alternative assets becoming available to more and more investors. So in these times, especially with we have the equity markets with such extreme vol volatility, um, and maybe, you know, you could talk about a little bit about what your strategies are. And I know, Mark, we're going to get uh, into you, I think, a lot more specifically on the private equity side. But maybe you guys could talk a little bit about what else you're doing for your clients, maybe um, to have some sort of exposure to or are you are you even looking for some sort of exposure for your clients to alternatives um, in, in, you know, these these type of uncertain times? I, I guess I, I can speak. Yes, we're, we're evaluating them. Uh, the one thing that we're very cautious of is back in 2003, 2004, back at the beginning of this century, um, you heard an awful lot about managed futures, alternative investments and these types of things and how it reduces volatility, increases return. Right. The problem is, is that a lot of what, what I notice is that a lot of times we tried to force a square peg through a round hole where it maybe didn't necessarily go in and make sense. The good news is, is that things have advanced. We have access to them, so they don't necessarily have to be uh, accredited investors or they don't have to be qualified, that there are opportunities for us to go to do that type of investing. So we're evaluating it, but I think that we have to, I, I think that, that as an advisor, as a wealth manager, what we have to do is be able to position it for the clients appropriately with their best interest. Mark, Mark Odo, how about you? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky topic because alternatives are such a grab bag. It's like everything that's not a stock or a bond gets lumped into this broad category called alternatives, which can mean a lot, right? And it encompasses a lot. So, yeah, I do believe you certainly have to do your due diligence. You have to know what uh, these things are intended to do, where the risks lie. And if you're going to build a, a good portfolio, you should combine strategies that have different drivers of return, whether it's top down or bottom up, whether it's, you know, kind of a market timing or more of a systematic type approach. I mean, there's lots of different ways to approach it. But, you know, the first thing I do is just understand the space itself. 
Uh, and I do think that's, I mean, that's one of the advantages for the financial advisor who is thinking ahead is that that is somewhere where you can still add value, right? Because, I mean, obviously the whole investing space has been rather commoditized with uh, robo advisors and these real cheap, you know, uh, beta type type solutions. And that's fine. But if you want to kick it up a level and deal with today's challenges, then yeah, I think alternatives do have a spot in, in a portfolio. And as as the advisor, you're going to have to you you can add value of doing that research and bringing someone some unique solutions that that uh, they might not have had access to before. Great points, Ariel. Right. I mean, for me and, and just uh, what we do, especially with the strategies, that yeah, I fully believe that in moments of extreme downward volatility, there's a tremendous opportunity to build wealth. Uh, the more downward volatility you experience, the more value there is in the market, and the further the market is going to have to come back to get to where it was and and beyond, right? In the if the 200 years of stock market history that we've had tell you that we're uh, uh, that all we do is just go on to higher highs, and there's crazy stimulus in the economy, which there still is, then why not take full advantage of it? And that's really what we uh, we, we like to do. I mean, we're, we're where we're scum. This, uh, this is a bump in the road that we're experiencing with the volatility now in the market, and uh, we're going higher. So, Marcus, I really want to uh, pick your brain here and get a lot of your insights because, uh, you know, especially on the private equity side, and we've seen so many changes um, in just the markets and in private equity and the whole IPO market in general. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, really the number of listed companies to, to decline significantly over the recent years. Um, we've seen the, you know, the IPOs mean market value um, seriously increase. I mean, I remember when, you know, in the 90s, companies going public is, you know, a $300 million valuation. Um, was an easy, you know, was a typical was a typical IPO that would get done, and, you know, we went to see that now we're seeing, you know, companies don't go public until they're well into the billions, um, and this obviously has tremendous impacts on the equity markets and opportunities, and especially, you know, now those returns seem to be living in the private equity space. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the, you know, the the decline in public equities and how that is moving investors over to the private equity space and what you're seeing. Sure. So I'll, I'll really just leave everybody. I'll try to be brief with three macro and three micro comments as it relates specifically to private equity. Uh, the good news, and I thought Robert pointed it out really well, is that there now is a distinction between trading alternatives, managed futures, hedge funds, and private equity, which I think is really helpful for the uh, end advisor. Um, and then there's private markets, be it private real estate, private equity. And I was around early enough where we saw the development of the Morningstar style boxes. And I think eventually now that pitch books owned by Morningstar, you'll see segmented uh, alternative or private equity, large LBOs, mid cap growth, real estate infrastructure. And I think the biggest risk, my second point would be to the advisor is there's all these platforms. There's a lot of new offerings. But much like small cap back in the late 80s and early 90s, it became popular, but people didn't know how to do the research on it. So I think my my you know caveat emptor would be um, make sure you do the underlying diligence on the manager and the firms, because uh, private equity is, if you just look at what Blackstone and KKR have done in growing assets is tremendous. Um, kind of the third macro point is people tend to chase things at the wrong time. Um, there's a lot of money flowing into private equity. And I think that will continue to your point, but the the uh, the whole idea of all private equity isn't created equal is similar to my small cap analogy. And then your other macro my, micro points would be, we only see the public market shrinking because the more money naturally that flows into private, the more strategics there are to take out private companies, the more money there is to do buyouts. And the more LPs, limited partners you have combined with data, all types of data, big data, AI, the more LPs you have, the more eyes you have watching the development. And I think people have really finally now become convinced that um, it is a completely different value creation model in private equity than in the public trading markets. Well, there still will be a huge need for the public markets, don't get me wrong. 
but I think it's now, according to Kai, a 9% of all uh, of the equity issued is in private equity. That's up from three when we started in 2005. Um, that's a huge chunk, so advisors are gonna have to pay attention to that. And then my last comment would be um, the, the talent, where talent is going um, out of schools and out of the public markets is going to private equity. Some of that's salary based, some of that's also just, it's a little more enjoyable, we find, where people have um, the ability to be more patient, maybe without as much stress as managing quarter to quarter. Those are great points. And you mentioned research uh, and to be um, looking at more of the research available in, in the private markets, private equity markets. Where would you suggest or recommend that advisors start to look? Yeah, that's a tough question because it's it, they, they could be resource constrained financially. They could be resource constrained in terms of talent. So having someone that has experience in the public markets does not necessarily translate to looking at private. So to answer your question directly, uh, they probably need to look at the underlying funds mm. and where they are in decile or quartile uh, rankings. Secondly, if you think of uh, large cap stocks having the least variance by manager, then mid, then small, private equity, you could drive a truck through. So you really have a huge selection bias if you're not picking top managers. Unfortunately, many advisors, either from platforms or not knowing how to properly assemble a portfolio by year of vintage, like wine, diversification and style, they'll just go out and buy different things and they'll end up in a really bad place with their clients. So um, they need a process, much like you put together a, a small cap portfolio again with guardrails on how much you would have in each sector or industry. And then the other comment on how to do proper research would be, I think there's probably a lot of good information at the CFA Institute, Kaya. Um, and my only last comment would be, if you're an advisor and, you, and, you're, and you're being sold something, most of the really good private equity funds or deals still aren't falling down to the advisor level. I mean, they're just, that's, you know, there's not enough because you have CalPERS increasing their allocations and family offices and, we just talked about inflation. And again, people zig when they should zag and vice versa. Um, I think the, the trend in allocation will double even again from here, according to Prequin. But that doesn't mean that just buying private equity will get you a return if you're not in the right places. Right, that's a, that's a great point. So asset managers like ARC, uh, which has introduced a semi-locked capital vehicle in a registered interval fund, those are increasing access for retail investors into private equity. Do you feel, and maybe get uh, some other insights and opinions from some of the other panelists, uh, is this access, how do you do, do you look at this as, as a benefit? Is this good for retail investors? How do you I'll take it quickly because we have an interval fund. So I think showing some degree of discipline, if you're an advisor, that forces your client using that word quite literally to be patient is good. I think in the case of Kathy Woods and ARC, I think she's seen the volatility and what can happen in an ETF. I think she's a smart lady with a very capable team and there are opportunities in her space. So maybe, maybe call it again, force patience in an interval fund will benefit those investors as opposed to knee jerk reactions. But I, I'd love to hear what other people think of kind of semi, it's a semi locked vehicle where you can get liquidity if I read the filing right about 20% a year. Who wants to jump in? <laughs> well, yeah, I do think that, you know, these types of, uh, you know, high growth potential uh, uh, solutions do have a place in people's portfolio. But I also do think uh, to the previous point that people always chase things at, at the wrong time. And, uh, I, you know, <laughs> similar to the other people on this call, I, we, we've all been through some kind of rather frothy markets in the past. And, and certainly the one that kind of comes to mind for me personally is kind of the 99 uh, bubble type period when you start looking at the, the really speculative stuff out there when people are throwing their money at NFTs and SPACs and all this just ridiculous stuff and flashing their cash around. It just, it's like I've seen this movie before and it does not have a happy ending. Uh, so, so certainly, yes, there is a, a role for high growth, you know, things, but you got to do it soberly, right? <laughs> you got you to have a plan, think it out and, and have 
put your money with quality companies and not a gift of a, a cat, right? Yeah, if we could, I would add one real comment to that. I think one of the, the issues on the chart you had up a moment ago is the dearth and, you know, dramatic decline of, of public equities. Not only will it continue, but I think it will have a great impact on making the companies that are still public uh, perform better because they're going to be under a, a higher level of scrutiny. And we have so much money now that moves quantitatively, not qualitatively that I actually think that, that this trend will probably revert to the mean to some degree, but probably won't go backwards. And I couldn't agree with Mark Moore. Um, the chase, the chasing of these unicorns, and again, that's not at all what we do. We're, 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 we're more value-centric, non-high levered type uh, investments. Um, that does worry me. I mean, every time I hear unicorn um, or half unicorn, it worries me. And I think people have confused private equity with chasing these crazy valuation companies. How about private debt? What are your th any thoughts there? If the market's grown extremely large, the shift to chase that yield has been immense. And people should just know if they're in a senior secured position, if they're in funds that are just syndicated to raise assets where they really don't understand what's going on with the credit. So again, it's a it's a buyer beware moment in the markets because you can you can go find a BDC with an eight percent yield and lose sixteen percent of the value in a year. I don't I don't think uh, investors really want to trade for that. Hmm, good point. So Robert, I read uh, one of your articles and in it you had stated that um, that investors should think differently because thinking differently helps you become a better or helps you invest better. So I thought maybe you could weigh in on that a little bit and, um, you know, maybe you could even, you know, provide further clarity into it. You know, how how could we think different? What way should investors be thinking differently? Yeah. So um, just recently I was interviewed by U.S. News. Um, the reporter had read a book or was taught, was uh, doing an article around a book that's that said that the older you get, the more equity you should have in your portfolio. Um, and, and so and it, he's, the, the premise was an 85 year old should have somewhere between 75 and 100% of their portfolio invested in equities. Now, I'm not certain that needs to be the case, um, um, uh, not taking one position or the other, but what, what I do know is that over the last 15 years, the way that money's been managed and as we look forward, given the information that we have now, things are probably going to be a little bit different. When you go to talk about inflation, you go to talk about interest rates, you know, all of those are going to have clearly going up versus the last 15 years. But then when you turn around and you go and you look at, at the other parts of it, whether that's uh, technology and the impact it's going to have on earnings. So in the most immediate time, what do you have to do? Well, you have to be looking for investments or vehicles that are investing in real companies that have pricing power, that have the ability to go through and, and, and basically protect their, their, their position, right? They're in a defendable position. You go and you look at, at, a, at a company just making up a hypothetical that basically had margins of 20%. Well, that, that, that company probably flew underneath the radar here over the last five years, right? But as we go forward, where there's more and more pressures on those margins, if that company um, has a business model and is in an industry that they can actually protect that, well, that may be a fantastic opportunity because 20% may be something really, really good. So you have to be thinking about those types of companies, right? You have to be thinking about those types of investments that take advantage of it with where that opportunity is. And, and, and go back and think through, it's not just about that tr t classic asset allocation, come in and fill out this questionnaire, come back in a year and see how much we've adjusted. That, that, I think that's out the window. We have to be much more proactive and dynamic in the way that we, that we manage that. That's interesting because I remember when I started in, in the business as a financial advisor, we were told that it should be your age whatever age you are should be your um, fixed income allocation. And then, right. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, whatever age you should, right. So if you are, you know, 70, 80 years old, you should have 70, 80% in fixed income, the rest in equity. So really interesting to hear that now shifting and more recommendations toward equity. 
Fascinating. Yeah, and what's interesting, and what, what's what's interesting about that is that if you followed that over the last fifteen years, they're out of money, right? right? Because interest rates interest rates haven't produced any sort of income, so they've had to sell assets. Where are they selling those assets, right? Is it out of the equities or the fixed income? Then you go through these periods of volatility, and their opportunities to gain are diminishing because because we have more and more volatility, and they 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 can't can't afford it. Well, now I feel old because interest rates were higher, obviously, when I started. <laughs> so, so, but um, yeah. Well, what what are your thoughts, Mark Odo? Uh, on this uh, this question specifically, or is, is um, <laughs> it just as a closing comment, or? Well, no, no. I mean, even well. Okay, how about how about this one for you? Because I actually read an article that you wrote uh, that said when it comes to strategy. Um, if you look at the markets like baseball, so what, what do baseball and the markets have in common? Yeah. So that piece I wrote, uh, just a little bit of background here. I grew up in Seattle, which means that I'm a, a Seattle Mariners fan, uh, which has been a very, very bad place to be for the last 20 years. But when I was growing up, uh, Ken Griffey Jr. was with the Mariners and to, to me, he was the best player I've ever seen. He, he was a phenom out there in his younger days. A uh, long time passed. But that being said, uh, he did, uh, right before being placed into the uh, the Hall of Fame, he granted this interview. And I, I pulled this quote out of this. And I'm going to read you this quote because I, I think it's very apt for what we're discussing here. And Griffey was talking about his playing days. And he says, acknowledge that this game will make you feel human very fast. Never get too high on yourself and never get too low. It's a reminder that you're never as bad as they say you are, and you're never as good as you think you are. And for me, that's really sober advice, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of volatility in this market. There's lots of emotion in this market. But you have to kind of keep an even keel and keep balance if you want to be successful. And that's, I think, ties back to a lot of the things people said here today. You know, have that plan. Focus on the long term. Don't let your emotions uh, override you. But I, I, I really like that because also it's, it, it's my guy. It's, it's Griffey. Right. That's great. Yeah. So let, let's, you know, everyone, please weigh in. Let's give some final thoughts. What do you want to leave listeners with? Best piece of advice, wisdom, words of wisdom, anything. Ariel, you want to want to start there? Sure. I think, uh, you know, for the RIAs in the audience is to uh, teach your clients to embrace an equity heavy or equity only portfolio as it'll mean less financial stress down the road for them uh, and for you, right? Uh, the second is really to uh, take full advantage of uh, severe bear markets because uh, to me, they are God-given wealth building opportunities. And um, and that's been the experience that we've had uh, since uh, for the last 200 years of this uh, stock market. Robert? Um, I, I just would say that I think right now, um, with volatility and some of the things that are going on for the RIAs in the world, I think they're, they're, that is the time that you really, one, really show your value to your clients, but it's also a fantastic opportunity to go to grow uh, your practice. So by communicating, talking with clients, uh, and uh, meeting them where they want to meet uh, at the cadence that they want, um, is vitally important, and that's where you have a huge opportunity to really make a difference, one in their lives as well as as well as your life. So it's a great opportunity right here. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, we didn't we didn't pre-plan this as a panel. It's interesting that we all agree. I think a, a heavier, a very heavy equity portfolio, be it in public or private, makes more sense as we live longer. Healthcare is better, and. I, it's funny, we have a couple of kids in their 20s and they're not believers in the bond market. And it's not because of, of high growth stuff. And the only other two comments I made, I looked up productivity gains last year were 6.6%. Think about that and watch that statistic where we are with inflation and how those two interact going forward because we've pulled so much technology. I wanna be clear, some of the unicorn companies are fantastic in what they're gonna do for us. Just the valuations don't make sense. Um, at some point in time, they will. And then the only other comment would be, I think you want to in public and private markets, we've spent so much time talking about indexes and ETFs. Um, I would just encourage you within your own shops, put your put your uh, qualitative hat back on and you know, a little more qual qualitative research will make these markets normalize as uh, so much quantitative money moves around so quickly. So 
I'm a little old school there, but um, there, there, there's a good premise to free cash flow and things like that when you're investing. All, all terrific points. Um, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to start shooting those over and we'll start taking some of those questions. Um, but I mean, we'll keep the conversation going. Well, what do you guys feel about um, uh, even just diversifying globally? Like how much, how much should be in um, emerging markets these days? Oh, I mean, I think emerging markets is kind of a tricky one. Um, I think one thing that, you know, people were speaking against uh, globally diversifying your portfolios with the, the onset of globalization, saying all these economies are coming together and they're all tying together. Everything's becoming very correlated. Uh, and that was true, you know, going back the last couple, you know, uh, 10, 20 years or so. But, you know, as we see this deglobalization trend and see these companies spin further apart, that might actually be a pro case for, for you know, having a higher allocation, because if these economies are separated and are moving separately now, that might decrease those correlations where it makes sense to, to, to mix them in again. Uh, there's lots of other things to factor into this, this, this discussion, but that's just, you know, one thing to think about. Yeah, it's interesting. I love emerging public companies. Yes. Sure. Develop businesses. Uh, well, uh, you know, but typically uh, we always have uh, typically in the normal times, not for coming out of a bear market, we're heavy on the uh, or uh, have a good representation on international market, especially uh, emerging markets. You know, for us, though, now with the dollar as uh, uh, lowly valued as it is, uh, we're going to wait until the, we have interest rates, Fed funds rate somewhere, hopefully, if they ever get there, in the vicinity of three, three and a half percent, uh, where we have a much stronger dollar and therefore uh, pile into uh, emerging markets then because the next cycle down is going to be, uh, you know, a dollar down, uh, foreign currency up. And um, so we're kind of light on uh, emerging markets now, but we'll look to get heavier as we um, move up along the, the curve on interest rates here. Mm. Mark, ask you want to finish your thought from from before? Sure. I was just saying, I think it's a it's a great strategy if you can find and I, I have a friend that runs a similar strategy um, and this has nothing to do with private equity, but larger emerging uh, stocks that sell into developed economies where their cash flow variability isn't de as dependent upon currency movements because they can hedge it away or their own local market. So, and I think, I think the world is quickly figuring out one other thing about the term emerging markets. Some, some of them probably should be classified now as developed that are still in the emerging bucket. Someone at MSCI probably needs to um, mm -hmm. get on the stick and, and revisit some of the uh, what I think are antiquated definitions of an emerging market versus a developed market. It's, it's not right. Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, one other thing that I just kind of throw out there, uh, cause it kind of ties back to all the things we discussed here. Um, the economist has ran two cover articles, both this week and last week that address lots of these things that we've been discussing. Uh, the one from last week, the cover story was, uh, how rate, how high will rates go? I know we had the uh, the uh, question about inflation being you know, potentially 10%, but there was a very in-depth discussion about the dynamics of, of rate increases that, that's worth checking out. And then this week's Economist cover story was, you know, what does you know what does a correction look like, and how is the market different now than it was during the global financial crisis? Uh, both very solid reads. I'd, I'd highly recommend them. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, even you know, we made the point earlier talking about COVID and even during COVID when the when the it first started and the markets were tanking, um, you know, it was an extremely rapid recovery to the point where you would have even have never known that there was even a crisis. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how you know, and, and I think I could see a little bit and it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this, too, because COVID was a health crisis. It wasn't a financial crisis. 
And so, you know, maybe that was part of the rapid recovery. Whereas if we're in this period of inflation and, and um, you know, and uncertainty relating to, you know, even the uh, supply chain crisis, all this could be more, you know, financial related. And do you think that that might make that the, the recovery slower, um, you know, a, a more akin to like a 2008 type of thing as opposed to a COVID? Well, hmm. I mean, that's a loaded question. I mean, there's lots of, I mean, these are some real big uh, questions that we're addressing here. Uh, I think, you know, when, when Swan was doing our kind of year end wrap ups and talking about lots of these various factors when it comes to inflation and people's risk taking tolerances uh, being rather high right now, um, kind of the way I summed it all up uh, 2021 and 2020 was that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? There's all these big policy conflicts right now going on and all these things that have gotten us to this place sound like good ideas at the time right and i'm not arguing that they are or they aren't but it's like helicopter money sure let's just throw money at people that sounds fun you know let's raise minimum wages to 15 dollars right why not um you know let's uh crack down on immigration both legal and illegal i mean there's all these things and i'm not taking a case right or left you know right or wrong here i'm just saying that all these ideas are got, well, got us to this place in, in, in the first place. All, all these ideas that we can solve this problem by throwing money at it or doing all these things. And well, guess what? All those things lead to either one, inflation, or two, a high risk taking uh, tolerance because people think someone's always going to bail them out. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So does working from home increase or decrease productivity in your thoughts? One of the things that I would say is that clearly COVID um, had some positive things that happened, right? We probably wouldn't be having this conversation virtually um, had COVID not advanced technology or the embracing of technology happen as great as what it did. Um, so I, the answer to that is that I think what's, I think that yes, uh, I do think that it has working for them has helped productivity. Um, what's interesting, um, BP has offices where, where I am, they're working every other week um, uh, fr from the office and every other week from home. Well, and kind of asking a few questions, the, the overall impression is, is that's what the employees wanted. So they become happier, they do better. I have a, I have a, a client who's a business owner, has a very successful construction company. When they sent everyone home uh, during COVID with all their laptops and everything, they were absolutely amazed at what happened during that period of time with them working from home they would get up at five o'clock in the morning and or they log on at five or five thirty in the morning and they would work till eight they would then turn around and maybe take an hour and a half or two hours where there was no work because they could manage this on this they could they could monitor what was happening on the system then they would turn around and they would be on call it from 10 30 to to 1 30 and then they would kind of disappear and then they would be back on at at 3 30 to 5 then they would disappear and then at nine and 10 o'clock at night, they would be back on. Now we all understand what that can actually go and do, but clearly, at least in this business owner's case, they were more productive. That's inside of them. I, I think all that's at, now, uh, at the ski resorts uh, working from uh, from the slopes. So right, I, I think that's a great question. It's it definitely something to think about because I know, like for me personally working from home, I'm always working more because it's right there. You're, you're just never away from it. You also have the impact of people that are dual income can balance kids better, schedules better. Um, you can work out more. I, I think it might be healthier, especially the model where people go back for a while because you still need camaraderie in the workplace. But um, I, I, that that's kind of ties into the productivity. Will will that trend? Because you also take out commuting time, right? Um, right. So I, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out, you know, in the next couple of years, if we don't have another variant jump up. It's interesting. Although you don't get the water, water cooler gossip. So <laughs> you, you kind of miss out on that. <laughs> but th this was really a, a terrific discussion. So, um, you know, so informative. I really appreciate all of your time and all of your, your insights and, I know the listeners appreciate it too. And um, really, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Clout again for assembling this 
um, distinguished panel and um, looking forward to many more discussions. So thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.